Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Kevin Ring. I'm president of FAM. We're back for another edition of our Heart to Heart series, where we discuss issues related to sentencing, prison reform, mass incarceration, and um, usually from the perspective of affected families and how they're coping with the system. Uh, today, I'm really excited because we have three, three guests that have been directly impacted. And we want to talk about a topic that's becoming more urgent because of the state and federal lockdowns of the prisons because of the COVID outbreak. And so that's raising some new issues in terms of maintaining family connections and bonds. And, um, and as that relates to visitation policies, calling policies, mail, all the rest. And so usually when we start these, I tell people about our campaign that we launched uh, a while back called uh, hashtag why I care or I care for where we talked about the people that we care about in prison and why. And so I'd like to use that as a setup to ask each of our guests um, to talk about you know, how they came to care about these issues, who they care about, who's loved one, who are they fighting for, and, um, and start with that. And so I just briefly will say, I'm very grateful. It's Ebony Underwood, Diane Cabrera, Vicki Pearl agreed to join us. Ebony, I'm gonna start with her, Ebony, is somebody who is sort of like what we aspire all of the people who come to FAM to do, which is you come because you have a direct connection to it and you learn the issues and then you fight for everybody who's in your position. And so Ebony has done that in a major way, fighting for her father, spoiler alert. Um, and so she, start, she started her own group, We Got Us, which is was, like she says, was started by, for, and about the children of incarcerated people. And so I wanna start with Ebony, if you could share a little bit about your story, your family story, and um, how you got into these issues. And thanks for joining us. Thank you so much, Kevin, for inviting me to join. I love FAM. I've heard about <laughs> FAM for decades. Um, my father, as you noted, um, has been incarcerated for now 30, gosh, it'll be 32 years this year. Um, he's 66 years old. He was part of the first round of convictions made under um, the federal sentencing guidelines back in 1988. And I was completely devastated by this experience, uh, never to talk about it ever. But um, fast forward to 25 years into this experience, um, the Obama administration decided that they wanted to reform the criminal justice system. And that's literally what got me activated because I found out that so many, um, there were millions of children of incarcerated parents. I had no idea, like not, not even knew that there was a term called children of incarcerated parents. So knowing that, that was one thing that completely moved me. But the second thing was the love for my dad. My dad has not stopped being a dad from prison. Like from the moment that he was there, up until this very moment, he is still very present in all of our lives, there's four of us, and he's been very, very present in all of our lives. And so that to me was at the least that I could do was to finally say, or muster up the courage to finally say something. And so I did, and you know, I began to advocate and he got denied in 2016. And I really began to advocate because I started to really start to see how many of us, there are millions of children, there are 10 million children across America that have been impacted by parental incarceration. And so I started, we got us now. <laughs> Everybody says we got us, it's we got us now. <laughs> which is a national nonprofit, nonpartisan organization built by, led by, and about children and young adults who have been impacted by parental incarceration. All right, we got us now. I'm never going to forget that. Thank you for clarifying <laughs> that. So I, I'm going to go to Vicki because um, Ebony's father is incarcerated and um, you have a child. So what, why don't you tell us about that perspective and what got you into advocating? Thank you. Uh, my son, Ryan, was 18 years old, was arrested and went into prison. He has to date served, well, he's got 21 years to go. He will be 30 years old New Year's Eve. So he's been in for 12 years. Um, I started out in the beginning, the first few years, like most people, I would just go do my visits, believe everything he was telling me and said hi to everybody who worked there and thought, okay, you know, we'll get through this. A few years ago, he was set up and he was put in uh, close management, which in Florida is 
solitary confinement. At that point, I started really looking into what was happening in our prisons and uh, got connected with some groups like Florida Cares and BAM uh, was able to learn. BAM was really great in teaching me how to speak up. <laughs> and that's kind of where we're at. Um, just trying to at least bring some fairness and uh, to both our sentences in Florida and our prison system and stop the torture. That's, that's it. Yeah. Well, and Diane, we've got uh, a daughter, a mother, and a spouse with you. So tell us about your experience and how you came to this. Well, my husband, Eric, has been incarcerated for about 10 years. And um, I'm happy to say that we're near the end. You know, we're within a couple months of the halfway house time. So I'm thankful that, you know, we're getting to the end of the tunnel, basically. And um, I think about a couple of years ago, I found FAM online and I just started, you know, commenting and asking questions and um, it just became my, you know, other second home to just learn about everything to do with what's going on behind bars because I don't have anyone else to talk to about this, you know, and I was not one to talk about it to anybody and I didn't know anybody who had this experience so fam has you know helped me to be able to talk about it and and connect with other people who have the same experience um it's just been a really great time and I I I am thankful that I feel like I have a voice about this whole situation you know um so it's just been amazing. And this, thank you for inviting me here. It's, I'm still a little nervous about it, but. Um. <laughs> You're not supposed to be thanking us. I, I always tell people, you know, fam is a collection of families. It's not, you know, even in our closed Facebook group where it's just the affected families, you know, yeah. that crowdsourcing of information is how we know what we know. And a lot of times when we advocate for different policies, it's because we heard about them from people who have gone through them. And so, you know, it's like one of those things where our knowledge bank is you all and your direct experiences that inform the work. And so, you know, we're grateful to you all who not only share your experiences, but then become advocates. And Diane, you just wrote a piece of a family perspective. And I just think it's interesting because the journey you went on and Ebony mentioned a little bit about, you know, starting out knowing this was her father and then becoming awakened to it in a way that says, I'm going to do something about this. And you wrote a little bit about that. So when, when this first happened to you, how did you start? Like, what was your, like, not tell people about it, feel shame, or like, what, what was that? Yeah, in the beginning, I didn't tell anybody. I really felt like basically the scum of the earth. I just felt, and I almost, I almost felt like I had a target on my back, like everyone could see it, even though I wasn't talking about it. I felt like everyone could see that I was just this single mom with her kid walking down the street. I just, it was really weird. It was a major mental issue in my head. And I had to push through that. And um, I was scared to death. I still remember the first time that I went to visit. I, um, I, re I literally, I remember everything. I remember where I parked. I remember getting out of the car, a, a lady asked me if my husband was in the shoe and I thought, I, he has shoes. Yeah, he has. I don't, what are you talking about? You know, I had no idea what the shoe meant, which now I know means solitary confinement. Um, you know, and I just had no clue. And I'm very glad that I had some people help me just through the visiting process, you know, and so I've been able to help other people in the, in, in the visiting process too. I, I am one to, you know, figure out if I can tell who needs help and who looks totally clueless because I was there so many times, you know? Yeah, that's that's the great thing is when families pass on that knowledge. I mean, this has been your whole life. So, I mean, I don't know if there was a point where, I mean, did you feel ashamed or did you, did you even know if you're supposed to feel ashamed because this was all you knew? I mean. Oh my gosh, yeah. So I absolutely felt so much shame and was terrified when it happened and did not share and, 
uh, just kind of journeyed through this experience. My father's been in eight different facilities across the country, not because of any infraction. He has zero infractions while he's been there, which is incredible for as long as he's been there. But, um, you, you know, you get moved and they up and move you, as you know. Um, and so, yeah, what Diane was just saying resonated because, oh my gosh, through the decades to see how things have changed dramatically, but still seeing people just completely green to the experience and coming in there and wearing all kinds of stuff that just will get you completely turned away. I think the worst, the worst experience of it was, well, I had like three different experiences that were horrible. The first one was my grandmother came in who's now past my father's mom. Um, she came in with open toe sandals and they were like, no. And we had just driven maybe like seven hours to see him. That was horrific. And then, <laughs> and I'm like, this is his mom. Are you serious? And they're like, no. And then, you know, you're in the bathroom and you're seeing women cutting the, the wire out of their bras because mm -hmm. you can't get through the metal detector without, you know, cutting out this wire in your bra. Um, hairpins you see you know women taking out there they get their hair all done you know i guess to see their you know their husband or their boyfriends or you know just a look you want to look presentable they haven't seen you in a while i've seen women have to completely take out their hair and mm -hmm. um it's just it's just horrible another experience was my brother who lives in california and he um flew six hours to new york and then we drove 18 hours because my father was moved to this west virginia facility and he had on khaki pants and they said, no, you can't come in. And the prison is in the middle of nowhere. And so being that being the case, he's like 17 years old at the time. It's, it was just, we would, there was no, there was no internet. We couldn't find, we had to go and literally search for like a Walmart somewhere um, in the woods. But yeah, that experiences like that, you know, it just, it, that definitely haunts you and daunts you and you just don't, you know, just, you don't want to even talk about this. Like who wants to share? Nobody's raising their hand to say, yeah, this is my experience. Yeah, I was, I, was, I had the same thing. The first time my daughters came to visit me, you're already so nervous and you don't, I didn't know the process. And they, um, I didn't know they got denied because they were wearing like stretchy pants. And, mm -hmm. and so I was waiting to get called because the last time I talked to them, they were going to be there. And so um, my ex-wife had to then like find a store a thrift store nearby like you said they're in the middle of nowhere so they're in Cumberland Maryland trying to find some place that they can buy some jeans to come into but then they're out of sorts because uh, they're young and they're nervous about this anyway and then I'm nervous and stressed out and it can destroy your visit so people don't realize there's just so much everything is so fraught because you have such limited time together um these are this is all in the best of circumstances and right now we're not in the best of circumstances so I want to jump into some of that and because I uh, Rabia is sending me a note that like some of the families who are listening are already saying they can empathize with everything we're saying. And I'm, I know that's true. Um, we're in a time where there's lockdowns and, you know, Ellen DeGeneres got in trouble because she made some crack when she was opening a show that she said, you know, I'm, I'm in the same house every day. We're in the same clothes or something. And it's, you know, it's like we're all in prison or something. And she got in trouble for that. It's just a joke that missed. Um, but I don't think that people realize what it is like. I mean, again, not in the best of times, but under lockdown, the idea that you know you can't visit. And so there's two things I wanna talk about. One is I thought families had a nuanced visit, a, a nuanced view when they shut the prisons down because I, a lot of advocates immediately said, oh, don't do that because visits. But I saw, I heard a lot of family members say, we want our loved ones protected. So if this will keep the virus out, this makes some sense to us. And so. I think they were open-minded about that. But here we go into a couple months and it could be further months, right? They keep delaying it. And that becomes very different because we're social beings. And I know from being inside, like we need to be touched. And I mean, it was one thing to talk to my kids. It's another thing to hug them. Mm -hmm. And so I wanna talk about the stress, the, the special sort of harms or, or problems that are caused by extended periods of not being able to have in-person visits and, and how do you convey that to people in a way that makes sense? So Vicki, why don't you start with that? You're, you're on mute. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay. Uh, yeah, um, 
for us, we had just gone these years with solitary. So it was really exciting. He, they had moved him for the first time within three hours from home, which Florida is a huge state. And he, we're in the very South. They always had him all the way up North. So this has been good for us. We've been able to visit often. And I was excited about Mother's Day. I hadn't been able to spend time with my son on Mother's Day in years. So this was, I was happy. I liked the idea of keeping him safe. Okay, I'm, I'm okay if you tell me I can't come in if you're keeping my son safe. Then I hear so many employees are coming in without masks and it's the only way that the virus is gonna get in there. That's a little bit upsetting that I can't hug my son, but you're going in and out, not even concerned what you're doing to him. Uh, I was hoping for Father's Day, but we just got word they're extending it. So I don't think we're gonna get Father's Day either. So it's hard. We, they do give us the JPay. We have uh, the video visits. We tried to, and I almost threw my computer through the glass door. So we have decided to not try any more of those because it's more frustrating. We, in two visits, which you get a 15 minute visit, I think we had five minutes where we actually could talk to one another. Uh, his brother tried one with him, it didn't work. So we've kind of given up, you know, it's kind of a fear. We are in Florida, we're kind of thinking that they may decide to replace our in-person visits with these video visits all the time. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping they see how unhappy we all are because it's not working. Um, they're already trying to take our regular letters from us and do them differently. So I can't wait to visit my son. Uh, my son is very huge and I'm kind of small. So his thing is he picks his mother up and I wait for that. Um, it's, it's hard, it's hard, but I want him safe. Yeah. That, you know. I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna go to Ebony because I, I saw a strong reaction to the replacement of in-prison visits uh, with uh, videos. We'll get to that, but first, uh, Diane, I'm gonna ask you, I mean, when my kids came, it was, I mean, I'm rubbing their back the whole time. I'm having them sit next to me, our, our, our legs are touching. You can't not have that. Right. And, and so, you know, how, how is it having, you know, your husband there and, and, you know, and, and as a mother, you know, who's got a, a, a son who's, you know, not able to be in contact? Um, it has been really horrible. You know, we um, try to visit once a month at least. Um, and we were just about to visit when this whole thing happened and it everything got shut down. So I was pretty upset that I didn't visit the weekend before it got shut down, but I couldn't, you know, you can't tell. But anyways, no, during visits, you know, my son, he's now 13 and he's just super tall now. And even though he's just, you know, super tall and looks like an adult, um, we try to make sure that they can sit next to each other and you know, he puts his head on his dad's lap and they try to, you know, just arm wrestle. And, you know, they can't do a lot of movement, but, you know, they try to do some physical stuff because, you know, boys need that physical, that, that the energy, they have that energy, you know. Um, so that's, that's been kind of hard. But um, for the first month of the quarantine time, um, my husband's place, they turned off all phones and all emails. So we weren't even able to talk for a whole month. And we've never, ever gone that long without talking ever, like never. <laughs> and so that was really hard. And, you know, on top of just the mental issue of this quarantine COVID mess, then not being able to talk to your loved one I, we were a mess. I, I was a mess. My son, you know, he kind of don't, he's, he's a lot better. Um, I am not. <laughs> so, yeah. Ebony, uh, 
you know, you've gone a long time. And, and I mean, how, how often do you get to visit? I mean, especially it must be hard if he's moving around and, and stuff. And, and what is that like? Yeah, so gosh, just listening to Vicki and Diane, I, wow, I can so relate. You know, Vicki, I hear you um, wanting to just give him a hug and then not being able to talk. And I was very disturbed to hear about these video calls because I know that they cost you, don't they? Yes. <laughs> Which is like ridiculous. Like there should not ever be a cost to connect with your family. I just think that's ridiculous. Um, and then Diane, I, I, can, I wholeheartedly hear you. Um, and just not being able to talk. So my father, as I said, he was very present. And because he was very present, um, we, could, we spoke all the time. So when this pandemic hit, not to be able to talk to him, my first reaction, having had been through this for so many years, is like, oh my God, maybe they moved him, right? Because he's finally at a space or in a facility where it's like not as far as usual. Um, and he's been there for a couple of years. Thank, thankfully, he's been there for a couple of years. So we haven't had to move around in a while. Um, but when I didn't hear anything, I immediately thought that, okay, they must have moved him. No, <laughs> he finally reaches out um, after not hearing from him for a couple of days. And he says they're on lockdown. And, and that basically that um, he doesn't know when he's gonna be able to speak. He also shared that at that point, and this was at the very beginning um, of the lockdown, um, he said, you know, I asked, did you have masks? You know, what are you doing? And he said, no, what we're doing is we're, you know, going to the commissary to buy underwear and we're using those as masks. And so, oh my God, <laughs> I was just like, what? Oh no. <laughs> and then I'm like, what about cleaning? Like, you know, the whole sanitary condition, like, what are you doing? And he's like, well, if this is the procedure, if you don't have wipes, then you can't use the phone. Again, this was early on. So I was like, do you have wipes? He's like, luckily I have wipes. However, there are other guys that don't have wipes. So then I'm like, dad, well, what about them and their families? They're probably worried sick. Like if they don't have wipes, then they can't use the phone. And he said that they ran out of wipes at the commissary. So I was like, well, what are they doing? And then, you know, it was complete lockdown. And so then we didn't talk to him again for a while. And then now there's still a crazy, it's, it's still so up in the air. I really honestly cannot stand the fact that we have not gotten any real answers about this for our family members because this is like re traumatizing, like all together. I feel like this experience in and of itself, the social distancing is what we've all had to do as part of this experience already, just pre coded. But now it just like magnifies it. And that is just. <sighs> Yeah, it's hard to listen to, to this stuff. I'm sorry. Because no. it just pains me in my soul. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it pains me in my soul. Um, I just wanted to say this before we move on to this topic because we got us now, and FAM and others are part of a campaign to try to make calls and, um, you know, Zoom visits and stuff free. I mean, you know, I'm with Ebony. It's this is something that should happen now during the, uh, pandemic and then should stay the policy. I mean, the idea that the government is sending out checks to people because they're, you know, because the economy is now destroyed and then they're supposed to use some of that check in order to be in touch with their incarcerated loved one is just makes no sense to me. Um, so hopefully we can make progress on that. Go to their website or ours to, to find the petition and, and to sign on. Um, we're already getting a lot of comments. I have a million things I want to ask you and I'll get to them, but I want to, I don't want to lose some of these. Um, Cindy, um, I'm not going to read last names just in case people want some privacy. She wanted to know, she wants to, and I've heard this before, she wants to advocate for her brother, but she's fears for him if she does. We always hear about this, right? People worry about retaliation. And Vicki, like, if you're pushing on the system and you're, you know, you're calling the ward and stuff, do you worry about that? Have you seen incidents where it has backfired? Yes. Yeah. Um, we, uh, they actually, I got a letter from Tallahassee at one point where they were stopping all my visits. And I had to start fighting that and stop fighting what it was I was fighting. Um, yeah, and I'm not alone. I, uh, I've gotten to know a lot of people and I know people who have not been allowed in before this for years to see their loved ones. Um, maybe because they just, you know, stood up for their loved ones. They made a call. I, 
I right now write to about 120 people that are inside and they will write to me and tell me, you know, that they, they won't give me my tablet or uh, I, I haven't been out for a shower in a week, things like this. So if I make the phone calls, I always have to worry what's going to come back on my son. And um, I've still got a lot of years to go that he'll be locked up. And it's, it's, it's scary. It's, it's scary, but I will tell you, you know, there's enough of us out there and we've, we work together and there are people who they can't hold anything over their heads. They are out here helping us and they're always willing. They'll make those calls for us. They'll help us. So don't give up. <laughs> well, Diana or Ebony, do you have anything to, you know, add to that? I mean, I will say along the lines of what you're saying, Vicki, uh, we talked about this last night with a small group. I know there's that risk, but if your loved one is in peril or, you know, uh, you, you have to take the chance to fight for them, I feel like, even though, you know, you, you worry about those repercussions. But Ebony or Diane, have you experienced this or aware of this? I um, get a little scared about it all, but um, I try to pick and choose the places I'm going to say something or do something. And um, so I've made some calls and my thing is I try to just stay really professional and really respectful when I'm talking to someone or even emailing and, um, and, and just thankful when they do, you know, uh, respond to my email. So um, I'm not trying to make any major demands when I call people or, or email um just basically inquiring about you know what's happening or when phones are going to be on so i try to stay very respectful um but there's a line i guess that i probably won't cross i mean i'm not going to cross and certain things i don't want to do i don't want to put everything out there you know um and and i just have to be okay with that and that's that's fine for me you know and and so I feel like we all need to decide yeah. what we want to do. Yeah. yeah. Ebony? Oh, sorry. Can you hear me? Okay, there we go. Yeah, so with my dad, he's, he's as I said, he has zero infractions since he's been there. So he's a very respectable guy and has taught us all to be very respectable because I, I guess, you know, <laughs> with his sentencing and what has happened and what continues to happen with him and how long he's been there. Um, and just with the lack of retroactivity in the law, you know, I guess the best way for him to show his ability to, you know, continue to rehabilitate himself and, and be the best person that he can be is to, you know, abide by the rules and just stay out of trouble. So if there were ever any problems and there have been, um, or issues and there have been, you know, he, he would alert us and then, you know, tell us what to basically do or reach out to an attorney, um, you know, or find a pro bono attorney, find me an attorney. Like we, <laughs> me and my siblings are like, we might as well have a law firm. <laughs> <laughs> the way that we've been dealing with this and the way that my father has called us to ask us to get on, uh, to support him do before I even started, we got us down before I even started advocating we have been working to try to help him. So yeah, I mean, yeah, I, I, I too, I too would suggest that you should absolutely advocate for your family member that is inside if there is some go something going on and definitely reach out to an attorney. There's a lot of support out there. I mean, fam has all kind of inf really useful information that um, it just has always been very informative to me and my family. So thank you always. Oh. Yeah. Well, and this is one of the reasons we think we need independent oversight of our prisons too. And this is something we're pushing is because yes, there needs to be, you know, inspections of the facility for safety and all that sort of stuff, but there also needs to be a place for families to weigh in with concerns because unlike other agencies where you'll have like whistleblower protection, no one cares if the person inside has a complaint. So the family members have to do that, but they do have these fears of repercussions. And so They've got to fix that. I want to read you guys something. This is from Jesse. I'm definitely not saying Jesse's last name because 
Jesse may still be in prison. I'm not sure. I know who he is. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I don't want to get him in trouble if you got a cell phone in there, friend. Um, but he said, we as inmates feel um, as bad at times asking for our, fan our loved ones um, just because what they have to go through. And so it means a lot that they fight for us as you know more than you can imagine. So I, I hope you get that from your words. I mean, I'm the only one of the four of us here who has been inside. And I will say, I always tell family members, the last thing you want when you're inside is your loved ones to worry about you. And you know that they do, but it makes you feel even worse. And so sometimes it's easier just to say, you know, fight for me, but take it easy too, because there's only so much you can do. And I, you know, you already feel bad. You put them in this situation. You don't want them to stress out. It sounds like Ebony's dad does that for her <laughs> just to try to make her feel like he doesn't want to stress her out. <laughs> um, Ebony, this question is for you. This is from Tony. She asked, when did you start reaching out um, to other children or other peers of yours who had incarcerated parents? You know, like when was that comfortable enough to do that? And when, you know, the stigma and all that that goes with that. So when I, so once I began to advocate and I started to speak publicly, people would literally come up to me and tell me, thank you so much for sharing. This is my story too. And I was like, oh my God. And so that's kind of what really like jolted me to say, let me, let me really look into what this is. And I made it my business to meet as many young people across the country as possible. I spoke at tons of spaces and universities and you know corporations and just sharing my story. And I began to meet so many of us and I really felt, figured out that there, there was this really fragmented community. Like we were not in community and there's so many of us and we're everywhere. You know, the, the narrative is that there's black, you know, primarily black and brown children but I mean, I mean, we just did an IG live yesterday with Miss Sierra Nevada. Um, both of her parents were incarcerated. Miss Sierra Nevada, 2019. She's also an actionist with We Got Us Now. Both of her parents, she's a young white woman and both of her parents were incarcerated. So this is all walks of life. It hits all walks of life. There is no, uh, yeah, this is, it's like the pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> but, look, but actually, actually, right. But the pandemic's an you know, example maybe of the opposite, which is that it hits some communities harder. I want to ask you this. You know, sometimes I feel like it's, it's definitely easier for me being white because I know I'm talking to an audience who don't expect this story from me. And I had the same experience as you when, I, when the FBI raided my house, all my neighbors came out you know, quietly and said, hey, I never told anybody, but my father was in prison or I, I never told anybody my brother was. So I started hearing those stories like you. But I do think maybe because I'm white, it's a little easier that... I'm not gonna bear extra stigma. People are gonna think it's interesting. Whereas maybe being a black American, you worry that it's perpetuating something. And that, and, and, that, and so that's a bigger burden on you to share that because now you have a higher hill to climb to say, oh, you know, don't lump us in or something with like, you know, so what, what But I have, this, I have this thing too about this whole privilege conversation. Cause I think it definitely is a privilege. You know, there is, not that you've asked for it, but it's just this thing with racism, of course, in this country, it's just right. what it is. Like people have this, you know, these biases. And so um, one of the major things that I wanted to do with, with We Got Us Now is to unravel the biases about this. And for those of our white allies to, yes, yeah, share about your experience and the privilege that you do, do, do deem from this because it's true, black and brown kids and black and brown families do get are more, you know, we're more likely to be, oh, okay, yeah, well, okay, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, okay, that's right. your experience. Right. That's surprising, so I'm more not surprised. So like you said, it's more interesting to hear it from you, but whereas with us, it's like, oh, okay, yeah, I thought so. Whereas like for me, you know, going to college and graduating college and doing the things and then people are amazed or like excited to hear about that or, you know, the fact that I worked in entertainment business or that kind of stuff, like people are excited about that. Whereas why? Like it should just be like whatever, you know what I mean? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. We have to fix that though. I think it's on us, us, us together to do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I always tell people when we were talking that question about, um, you know, having family members intervene, or if you, if you have a problem in prison, I mean, that is one area where I know I was treated better by the prison officials because I was white. And I think it was assumed because I would probably be able to make it harder for them if, 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 they, if they did something against me. 
Whereas I think when they have somebody who's powerless, they feel like they can sit on them and there's gonna be no repercussions. Diana, uh, Diana or Vicky, do you have anything to share on that? Um, well, oh gosh. Well, I do think that um, in the beginning, I heard, you know, people say statistics, if you're, if a parent is in prison, the statistics of the child, you know, just having the most hor horrific life ever is super high. And, you know, I'm being sarcastic there, but basically that's what it was. And, and so I just made it um, a huge mission to make sure that's not going to be the case. You know, I have a regular career, you know, yes, I, I went to college. I, you know, I, again, I have a career. My son is doing well. I try to make sure he's involved in everything. So I, I am trying to make sure that does not follow him, you know? Um, so that's one little piece of my experience with the kid thing <laughs> with my son. Well, oh, go ahead, Vicki. Um, I was just gonna say, I kind of found, and I've always been this color, so I can't tell you how anybody from any other color is dealing with anything. My husband is a firefighter. I was, had a business and, you know, then was stayed at home, homeschooled my boys, things like that. And for when things happened with my son, there were a lot of people that just kind of wanted to stay away. You know, our neighborhood is firefighters, police, you know. Um, it was like, what did we do wrong? Because I didn't know anybody in prison. <laughs> All right. Um, and I felt I was kind of, we were kind of judged that way, you know? I mean, he had everything. What did we do? We must have done something. Mm. Husband and I dealt with that one for a long time until we started telling people, yeah, he took drugs. <laughs> okay. And it went from there. But um, where some people, you know, like I go to these meetings with people that have were in for life and they've gotten out on parole and stuff. And we'll tell it, we, we talk with each other and tell the stories. And their families maybe didn't get as much as I got and my husband. My husband was, who never missed a day of work, stayed home for like three weeks because he didn't know how to face anybody. But you guys said, when we started and then started talking to people, my brother was in prison or my uncle is in prison. And, and you start finding out you're not alone in this. Um, there's a lot of us and it's a matter of, it, I'm at the point now, don't stand by me in line at the grocery store because we're gonna discuss prison. <laughs> Um, it, it's, I, I'm not afraid of it anymore. I want everybody to talk to me about it. And if I can help you, if I can't, I usually know where to send you for the help. And because I think it's the only way we're going to see change. Yeah. But I want to focus on something right now, which is the lockdowns, because like I said, this is a special circumstance. And to me, there's two issues that come with this. One is that everyone's loved ones um, is locked down sort of in the facility. So they're not getting out of their cell or they're not getting out of their unit. Uh, they're not getting time in the rec unit yard. They're getting less time to make phone calls. So there's, so there's that aspect of it. Then the second aspect is visitation, right? So um, those are two different things though. I mean, visitation may be, they may be slow to do in-person visits until they get this thing, you know, you know, we're seeing the delays, you know, that they're keep announcing further delays. And so I don't know that there's a, like a universal position that families have on this, but tell me how you think about this in terms of, you know, yes, I want to see my loved one, but I, I, I can wait until I know that that facility is safe. Um, or two, for his or her mental health, I need them to be able to get out of their cell more than they are. And so how do we go about pushing the system to do something, you know, without we get to develop sort of a position again, not one position, but like, I'm not even sure people are really thinking about this because these deadlines are going to be extended slowly, right? It's going to be, okay, no more visits for two more months. We're going to go through the summer. Then we're going to worry about the fall. 
when we make it the second wave that's going to hit the prisons hardest. I mean, people may be looking at not having in-person visits for another year, you know, conceivably. And so, you know, what, what, what do we say about that? And, and, and in the interim, what do we do to make sure our loved ones don't go insane being stuck in a cell where they can't get out or make these phone calls? And so I'll just open that to anybody that's thoughts on that. Well, I just quickly, I just think they really should allow them to have access to the rec yard. I mean, I know uh, my husband, he's in a dorm of about 60 something men and they're just bored to death. Um, they do have a TV, which is nice, but just getting outside and if they can do that in units, you know, maybe one unit goes on Mondays, the next unit goes on Tuesday. I mean, it, that's not that difficult to try to figure out. Um, so I think that I think is the first, I would like that to happen so that they actually have a little bit more access to just going outside and, um, you know, feeling human again. I know for me going outside and talking to other people, I feel human again. So I, I can't imagine how it would be in, in a cell with one other person, you know, I'm glad at least they have, you know, a number of people, but still that's an issue also. I, or Vicky. I, I'm sorry. I, um, I, we've been lucky where Ryan is. He has not been in any type of lockdown, which is great. We don't get to visit him, but they have, according to the state, they have had no positives where he's at. So every so often they'll have to stay in for a day until everybody checks out and they're, but so far he's been okay. I do have friends that have been locked up now for a very long time. Uh, commissary is, <clears throat> excuse me, you have to order it and hope that you get it. Um, I'm having a real problem with a lot of our people that are actually in any of our type, like my son was in the solitary because they're not getting phone calls. Their families don't know if they're okay. And, and one of the worst things, everybody always says, it's us on the outside. They are so worried. I get letters from some of these people asking me to call their moms and make sure their moms are okay. And I'm making calls. Um, that's, that's hard. You're, you're talking about their sanity when they're locked up. Well, you're taking them being locked up and then not knowing what's happening with their families all at the same time and no contact. Uh, JPay, our tablet people are giving some free phone calls, but these people aren't getting it. They don't right. get anything. That, that needs to change. Somebody needs to realize this is a special time, okay? You punishing them, fine. But right now, family needs to know that family is okay, both inside and outside. You know, I, I, we talked about how um, video visits can't be a substitute for in-person visits. But in a world where in-person visits are going to be limited for the foreseeable future, I mean, what is your thought on just, I mean, all prisons should be instituting some sort of video visits, I mean, in the interim, do you think? So that is like one of my biggest complaints, you know, just hearing just the dichotomy between all of us. Um, why is it, like, that was always my complaint. My father would be at one facility and he, you know, he'd get all this type of education that was in place, yeah. but it was not pandemic. So, you know, he'd go to another facility and then it'd be nothing, like they'd be nothing there. So there are, I guess there are facilities that provide video, um, video communications, I won't call it video visits. That's a narrative that we should not, we should not be calling it video calls. This is not a call. We are not visiting each other right now. <laughs> <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Yeah. Let's just change that whole narrative because that is a false that I think that the telecommunication companies love for us to say so that they can capitalize yeah. off of us. So no, it's not a busy video visit. Um, yeah, so that's my number one gripe. And then but my second gripe about this entire situation is that it is really scary. We, you know, I, I, you asked earlier, you know, I was literally on my way, so, similar to you, Diane, to go see my father the weekend where they completely shut down the city. I, I'm in New York City. 
where they completely shut down the city. I'm like, oh my God, I don't know when I'm gonna see him again. And I see him every month. So now it's been what, two months? I haven't seen him, three months? Oh. Um, so, so calls would be great being able to communicate only if they were for free. So nice. I feel in county jails, in state prisons, and in federal correctional facilities, we need to ensure that during this pandemic, phone calls are free. Video calls and communications are free. They should not be charging you. You should not. I don't care about the two free JPEG BS stuff. No, 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 no. That is literally our lifeline. And why are we being harmed? Especially if you are a family member, especially if you are a family member, that should be a consideration. That's the yeah. least that they could do because they haven't told us anything. I have to say in the federal facilities, my father is just yesterday, he told me that they are no longer on like a full lockdown. They have been in groups. You talked about, Diane talked about, you know, being in uh, dorms. So the dorms are let out at a time um, to go to rec. My father is 66 years old though. So he is part of what is considered the vulnerable population. And uh, for me, I, I just want him to come home now. Like it's so long, he just needs to come home. Like if he's 66 years old, he's part of the vulnerable population. Like he's been there for 32 years. Like what else do y'all want? Like at the end of the day, please just bring him home at this point. So I've been asking and praying whenever I get a moment to speak to him, please do not go into general population. Now right. that this is the case, don't do that. Yeah, don't yeah. do it. So it's really scary. It's really scary. So I can imagine what Vicky was saying with the parents or the, the people inside, even the, the, the people that are incarcerated, concerned about their moms that are elderly or, you know, what's going on. It's just, it's a mess. And you bringing up the, the idea that it may be a year. I'm like, oh, no. I don't know. Well, you know what? That, know. I'm serious. That's like, that's what this whole show is about because we've been talking about it as a staff you know we've been we've been fighting for releases and you know some are doing it some aren't we're talking about doing testing some aren't some aren't and then we started thinking about visiting and we started people say well you know it's worth it it's short term and it's like it's not clear it will be short term um you know because it's you know i don't know how they're gonna make that determination um i'm scared to have this conversation honestly yeah, publicly. I'm scared about this conversation publicly. I'm sorry. I'm just going to be straight up and tell you. I, I, <laughs> yeah, I anything. Yeah, well, but I, but I think it's important that before it just happens quietly, we talk about it and raise the concerns that we will have, because for the prison, it's going to be easier just to say, look, we still have positive tests or we still have a threat, you know. So the the best thing is, and people will accept that it's a safe thing to do is to keep them closed. That is a lot to ask of families. Yeah. I don't think they should close everything down. They should just figure out a way to, you know, make it by unit or something. If everyone's positive and you've been positive for two weeks, or I'm sorry, negative, and you've been negative for two weeks or more, you're in the safe zone for a visit, maybe, and, and schedule that visit in the next two weeks or something. I, I just think they should be able to figure that out well but the visit goes both ways right it's 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 about people from the outside bringing it in yeah and and you know give me a thermometer test do something that's fine i you know we practically go through i mean we go through a metal detector we do all these other things a, a, a thermometer scan isn't a big deal you know yeah. that's fine i'll do that <laughs> yeah well no i i think it's just one of those things that you know I think it's time to start saying, and again, I know that people get worried. In Pennsylvania, they're using Zoom and people get 45 minute calls. Um, I won't say visits ever again, just like I'll never say we got us. Um, uh, they, yeah, they have 45 minute video visit communications. <laughs> but, um, and they're saying it's going great. They've had a couple incidents where you can imagine Families who haven't seen each other in a while are not behaving perfectly, but um, <laughs> but it's going well. And it just seems to me it's 2020. We should be able to do that. That shouldn't be a favor that they're giving us. There shouldn't be some treat that, that, I mean, especially if you're not gonna allow people to have contact. We know that keeping family ties reduces recidivism. It's good for the families. It's obviously good for the kids. Um, 
that has to happen. And so I'm just, what I'm wondering is like, I know we don't want to think about a world where there's no in-person visits for a long time, but that may be the reality. And if it is, you know, these systems need to come up to speed quickly on getting other ways of communication. Uh, communication. Can I ask you a question? Charge. What do you think about that? Do you think that the communication should be free? You know, if it is video calls and if it is like, you know, um, phone calls for a year, I mean, if we have to endure this, shouldn't it, shouldn't the communications be free for us? Oh, of course. Yeah. 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 yeah I, I don't think anyone disagrees with that. I mean, no one here does, but we're an easy audience. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> no, and I agree with you, even if it's, even if you limit it to family. I mean, right. you know, you've, you've separated these people, understandably. And now, you know, because of something that's not their fault. And like I said, let's be honest about, you know, a lot of the people who are experiencing family incarceration, you know, are not rich. And so the cost of that communication means more from that family budget than it does for most people. And so, you know, I was, I was lucky, I didn't have to worry about my five cents a minute on core links. But for other people, it did mean not making phone calls. Um, and so it just feels, that feels like such a dinosaur that, that we, you know, knowing how easy communication is and the way we all use to text each other and stuff on the outside, that it's still so, you know, ridiculous that you're paying those prices per minute. Nobody would even think about that. So Vicki, you're in Florida where, I mean, I think, you know, they just extended the, you know, the, the visit ban, I think. And, and yeah. so, you know, how do you approach this? Well, like I said, I'm, I'm at a point right now where the safety is a big thing. I don't know if you can see this. This was the picture I just got from my son wearing his mask. I get to see his eyes, okay? because they can't do their video contact, let's call it that, video contact um, without a mask on now. Makes sense, but again, there's more of my son I don't get to see. Um, I don't know, you're scaring me with a year. I mean, I'm going day by day on this. Uh, our state seems to keep prolonging it two weeks at a time. Um, I did tell my son on our call the other night that because he'll he keeps saying they're talking in here, mom. Did they are they? And I'm like, no, honey, that's being extended. So I'm trying to prepare him for that. I'm trying to prepare me for that. Uh, I think I think it's crazy that they charge what they charge just for a phone call, let alone these types of visits. I got a girlfriend whose son is in county one county over is in county jail. I think it costs her $7 for a 20 minute call. That's outrageous. Yeah. Okay. That needs to stop. There's a way our governments have enough money to make this stop. It would, it would make our prison safer, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. It's gonna start having major problems with the people inside if they can't be with loved ones. So at least give us that because it is a safety concern for everybody, the people who work there, everybody. Yeah. So. My husband, um, the other day when he called, he gets calls now every other day. And he said, um, it was, a, they were a little anxious about it because there wasn't a lot of, they all, um, I'm sorry, obviously all of them were anxious to get on the phone. So that was building up the anxiety in all the men waiting for the phone call. And so obviously I'm anxious on the phone call, trying to get through everything I want to talk to him about. And, and um, I could just think, you know, that is not a great um, situation, you know, so give them a little extra time so that they're, they're, they're peaceful with this. Um, and it would obviously help everybody, you know, just even the, correctional officers, just if everyone is a little bit more peaceful, right. we can get through this together, you know? Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I never defend the BOP, but, you know, when Congress made the phone calls free, you had the problem of you're under lockdown. And then some people were saying, oh, the call's free, but I only get five minutes right. because they were only out of their cell for a certain period of time. Now, there's not much you can do about that. I mean, if, if social distancing practices says to do it this way, you know, 
but it just it also shows you can do it though right like so much of what we're going through with covid everybody telecommuting or doing other things is well why don't we make this the new normal and i do think we have to say you can do this you did it during the pandemic you could make these calls free um and and so listen let me just say one thing because i'm scaring everybody about saying no visits for you i don't know that <laughs> I, I hope that's not true i hope that's not true i just want to say this i do think we should you know demand of the D department of corrections what is your plan for reopening visits because we're also asking them for mass testing right and so if they're going to test everybody we're going to get more positives and those are going to be the excuses to delay opening them so we have to think through if, if if we get more testing and there's more positive and they say they can't open then we do need interim measures in place like free visit visit um video uh visits oh. visit video oh, con oh, video oh. contact yes <laughs> um but so that's what I want. That's the discussion we started having internally. And I think we need to start having um, as well. We're about out of time. So this is the part of the show where I ask everybody <laughs> to just uh, share some final thoughts that we didn't get to because I talked too much. So I'm gonna start with you, Ebony. And I wanna say thank you so much for all the work that your organization does. Thank you for shaking off stigma and just leading and, and getting other people involved in this. That's, you know, that's what FAM does. And we're so glad that you do the same. So let's start with you. Thank you so much for having me. I appreciate even just being able to share with these just wonderful community, Vicki, Diane, you, Kevin, and everyone else. Um, I would just say, please go to wegotusnow.org. Uh, children from incarcerated parents all across the country, we created a, an open letter and we have a petition um, to protect our parents behind bars, hashtag protect our parents behind bars. So if you please sign that change.org petition, we would be very happy. Thank you. Let me just ask you this. How is your dad doing? I mean, are there is there any outbreak where he is? So there are a couple of uh, staff that have had um, the uh, the virus, but I don't know anything else. Yeah. You know, some of our demands, for the demands, we ask for free phone calls. He's in the BOP, so free communications is happening right now. And yeah. also the um, the mask, they have been, he has an N95 mask, he says now. Um, and then also the last thing is that um, they've been outside. So it's a, it, to some degree, it's, it's they, I feel like they're listening and they have the notification. We ask for notification. They have like now this updated website. So you're right, they can do it if yes. they want it. Yes. And let me just say, in case there's any doubt about this, Ebony's father should not be in prison a day longer. He shouldn't be in prison as long as he is. If there's any injustice in this world, he'll have his sentence commuted or somebody will send him on home confinement tomorrow. So I just want to be clear about that. Uh, Vicki and Diane. Well, okay. For me, um, Ryan, like I showed you the mask, we're having a thing now where they are, um, they're getting disciplinary reports for not wearing them. And it's getting hot down here in Florida. Yeah. We have air conditioned prisons, most of our prisons. So we're kind of having a bit of a problem with that and trying to figure out how to work way around that. So if anybody has any ideas, we're open to suggestions. Um, other than that, uh, I'm hoping that you're wrong with a year, Kevin. And I'm hoping this is over for all of us soon and we get to be with the people we love. That's about it. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you. Okay, thanks for having me. And um, I'm gonna go to your website, Ebony. I'm excited for that. And I wanted to say, um, keep writing. Uh, my husband and I write letters every day and I tell him everything. Just random things um it's nothing major but um i i, I want to keep him involved in what's happening on a day-to-day -day basis here and uh we pray and um keep talking to other families and um stay connected with fam that's my thing that gives me uh you know my energy for the day well thank you all and i i, I just want to say it sounds self-serving to say about stay in touch with fam, but I do think it makes sense to stay in touch with people who are going through what you're going through. And I see a lot of people give each other strength by just sharing their story with one another and just a lot of wisdom. And I would say to anybody who's watching, who's not an advocate now, learn from these women, which is to become smart about what you're doing because you can work, you know, you can work a lot without working smart. 
you know, you could write letters to people who have no say in your loved one's, you know, incarceration. You need to know, is it state? Is it federal? Who are the decision makers? Who are the problems? And, you know, who do I call? Do I call the region? Do I call the warden? You know, how do I work this? And so, you know, you can get smarter about it and you can ask people and, you, and, you, and you'll become more educated about, about how to become a better advocate. And so I know Evan does that with the folks who reach out to her. We try to do that as well. You guys are all examples of that. And so we're grateful for you being here. And um, that'll be it. We'll talk to everybody next week. Have a good week. Okay. Thank you.